Hi there, everybody. Good to see you. Um, I saw the list of participants. I see some familiar names and some new names. So um, welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm happy to see you or to hear you or to talk with you and to discuss with you at the ACCU conference. Um, this time speaking from my home office and this time talking about a topic I have a problem with. Um, in any case, if you, uh, if you have any questions, um, please use the Q&A tab and, uh, or interrupt me. Actually, I don't know whether it's possible if it's an important question and I might be able to answer, but I also might be able not to answer because there's one problem with this talk. Um, I have to give a general disclaimer. Um, the problem is um, we had STD thread in the C++ standard since uh, C++ 11. And we knew that there's a problem and nobody wanted to do the work to fix it. So I did. Unfortunately, I'm not a concurrency expert. So um, you will recognize um, because you, if with your questions, I'm pretty sure you will drive me to my limit. So because I don't understand all the details of what has happened, I drove this topic. Um, I learned a lot. And what I really learned is um, how important the outcome of what we did was and why it was so complicated to do that. So um, please excuse if I can't understand all the details, maybe here are some others available also that might help. Uh, this, by the way, might be another reason why this is an interesting experience and maybe an interesting talk because um, you can learn that you can drive in C++ even things you are not a, an absolute expert. So what are we talking about? Um, in the C++ standard, we have um, a type called std thread. So we can start a thread by just declaring an object, passing um, the name of the callable, the functional lambda we want to call, and some arguments that are passed to this, to it. So, but if just if you program that, um, there's already a bug, unless columns don't matter for you. Um, because uh, the design of std thread has a serious flaw. Um, it's not okay if you just call the destructor. Um, you need some cleanup. And for this cleanup, you have to do something before the destructor is called. Um, so you have either have to call join or detach. Otherwise, uh, the destructor of thread will terminate calling a bot and which uh, usually causes a coda. So the way to fix that is pretty easy. You declare your thread and you say, let's wait for the end. That's a common approach with detach. You just lost any connection to the thread unless you program it manually. So um, the problem with this is there's still a bug unless call numbers don't matter. So because um, if you um, between declaring the thread and between join have an exception, um, join is not called and that means um, you get you terminate and you caught up. Um, that's really a big problem we have. Uh, it looks pretty easy to fix that here. So, um, well, you have a try catch block in between, catching any exception and then joining or handling the exception before you, for example, rethrow the exception upwards. But the whole idea of uh, RAII types, well, that is, that an object encapsulates initialization and encapsulates a cleanup, cleanups was um, that we don't have to do things like that. And um, so, yeah, we had a serious design flaw in STD thread. And the first good news are this is fixed. This is fixed in C20, but we couldn't keep the name uh, because this breaks binary compatibility. So um, we introduced something called jthread. J stands for joining thread. 
Okay, so in C, in C++ frankly, you can just do that by adding an additional J. Um, the problem is, uh, is, is pretty simple to use in this simple case, but the moment um, you have more complicated scenarios, it got, gets even worse. So assume you have a thread, you learned, okay, let's have a try catch uh, cross between starting the thread and join. And then um, let's start another thread, starting another thread much might throw an exception. So we have to catch it, but even then sometime we have to join it. And again, we have to catch exceptions. So um, now things become a little bit complicated because you want to join it at the end together with the other thread. So things you have to do is something like this. You say, okay, let's declare thread T2 and let's then move assign a temporary thread uh, inside this try catch clause. And then in the catch clause, uh, we might have both cases. We might, well, at the end we join also T2. And in the middle, um, we have to check is T2 joinable? That, that is, did we come to this point? and then we join, otherwise we don't. Um, so things like that, you have to program. And yeah, again, just declare two J threads and that's it. And let me show you an additional, um, that, um, an additional example. So assume I wanna design a, a type uh, representing a task I can start. So um, that's, uh, and I want to start it in a, in a separate thread. So, um, excuse me, tasks, plural is what I design here. So I can start multiple tasks in, its, in their own thread. So what I pass here to start is something I want to call. One way to implement that is to say, okay, let's, see, let's use std array of std thread, 10 threads, up to 10 threads, we use, but we don't use all the entries of this array. Uh, we just here have here a number of the count least started threads. So the default constructor does uh, nothing, uh, just the initialization that we have no started threads. And for the STD threads in the array, we have a default constructor. And start takes whatever we pass, um, moves that into a thread to start a thread, and moves that thread into this array. And um, increases the number of started threads, of course, with an assertion checking that we are not beyond the limit. And the destructor will at the end then say, okay, let's uh, wait for all started threads to finish, so to join them. Uh, and now you think about, oh, let me return uh, this task I have defined here in a helper class, in a helper function, a couple of tasks and want to return them to the caller. So, um, which is, means you need a copy constructor. Well, you don't need a copy constructor. You need at least a move constructor here. Copy constructor is not supported by threads. So you need a move constructor, which you can enable. And if you do that, you have a bug. And that bug is a very interesting one because that even means that your program will, in the middle of calling this destructor, um, or, or excuse me, this, this the use of this return will uh, have a call down. So, for example, you call this function, assign it to another object task, and you get a call down. Why that? Because move semantic is broken here. That's one of the few examples where uh, move semantic doesn't work. The generated move semantic doesn't work. So if you have here um, your object TS, before you move it to somewhere, we have two threads, both are stored here, and then we move it to somewhere else. Unfortunately, the default move constructor or move assignment will move the threads, but will not move the number of threads. So um, at the end, they're moved from object. So the value we had here locally or which was returned um, is in an inconsistent state. And we will call here um, for two elements, we will call join, although there is no thread to join. And that will create an exception. So um, the code should have been, if what the thread is still joinable, then join. But again, this is a problem we have because 
we have um, a problem in the design of STD thread. It's not a RAII type. So let's fix it. That's the point. The problem in, um, oh, here's a question. Um, doesn't RVO help in this example? Um, well, that depends a little bit. Um, first of all, RVO might help, yes, of course, but uh, please know that I act intentionally didn't use here the initialization of a task. I used the move assignment here, and that move assignment is not optimized the way we call the move assignment operator here, for sure. And, um, and in addition, even here, um, we don't have a guaranteed um, return value optimization. That's a named re return value. So we have named return value optimization and named return value optimization is not required to be done. We discussed that currently for C++ 23, but in C++ um, uh, 17, we introduced only the requirement that um, return value optimization has to be done. This is not RVO, what is happening here. So that doesn't help. So history, we knew about this problem uh, a couple, for a couple of times. So even in, in 2013, we already had a first paper saying um, the structure of thread should join if the thread is joinable and not uh, and hasn't called joined yet. So by Herb Sutter, we had even votes about that, pretty strong votes. Um, and we, we vote strong in favor, weakly in favor, and strong against and weakly against. And but uh, this was not accepted and not not done finally. And in 2016, again, Villa Votiline had a paper thread and RAII, which discusses the same problem. Again, we had really strong consensus that we want to have an auto-joining thread type. And we had even consensus we want to have it in C17, but nothing happened. And um, so I started in C17 with my first proposal of a cooperatively interruptible joining thread, because as I said, nobody wanted to do the work um, in the concurrency working group. So um, yeah, I, I tried to do it. Um, it was interesting. One comment I will remember for, my, for the rest of my life was um, explicit threading needs to die. We don't want to fix anything at all there to make it better. Well, that was not the common opinion of the room, but uh, it was an interesting situation in these days. So um, at least the outcome was, um, if I propose something to fix, it has to solve the problem that we might also be in a waiting for condition variable or other blocking functions. So I gave up, I'm not an expert. That's, that's beyond my knowledge. And um, in 2018, there was a re request, I think by Herb Sutter, and um, because we, we, we saw something going on in the community. So there were a couple of style guides recommending not to use STD thread. And they had their own thread. They recommended to use boost thread or GSL joining thread or whatsoever. And um, Herb formulated it nicely saying, this is a community voting with their feet almost to the point of rebellion. Um, we have to do something. And uh, especially as we found out when we looked at the replacements um, for SCD thread that they had serious bugs. So they asked me to do the work again. And I did and um, came up with a second version of my proposal and uh, that took then some time in 18 and 19 and with sim significant simplifications, uh, reference implementation, into, into, uh, um, merging it with stop tokens by Lewis Baker. So that was a history. And finally, we have it in C20. Took too long, but it, something good came out, I think. So, what is the design? The design is pretty simple. So, if we have J thread, the join should be optional. If we haven't called it, the destructor will call join if the object is still joinable. Okay, so a very straightforward design is 
let's create class J thread, uh, wrap around the thread, and add the corresponding functionality. So um, let's have a user constructor taking what to call with arguments and a destructor waiting for the end. And roughly speaking, all we have to do is this. Um, we say, um, okay, let's initialize a thread with all the arguments we get. So let's simply pass them to the underlying STD thread. And in the destructor, we add, if the thread is joinable, we join. That's it, it would work. And so if, if you take code like this, um, it will now work and automatically join, even if you skip to have this try catch block, it will on an exception join. However, um, there was one additional problem. If we have here uh, no exception, uh, if we have here an exception and we come to join, we might come to the constructor and that might mean we wait forever for the thread running in the background. And that can become very, very complicated and really hard to track because a thread might have sub threads and sub threads and they wait forever for, because we, we are in the middle of something where if we interrupt it or if we, if we wait for the end, whatsoever happens. So that is, a little bit dangerous. So we thought about, well, if we change this design, let's add a new feature saying, well, before we stop the thread, we signal that the thread should stop. Ideally, we cancel the thread. Um, so if, if we come to the destructor, that means uh, we no longer need this thread. We haven't called join, so we don't explicitly want to wait for the end. So let's stop it. Let's stop running that thread. Cancellation or whatsoever. That causes cost um, a couple of um, interesting discussions. So Hapsata came out with this slide, thanks to her, um, where we talked about a couple of alternative um, alternatives. Um, so one alternative is we kill. We, we build in something that we can kill a thread. And the question was, do we, how does it work? Do we have some, some corresponding code in pthreads and Java and .NET or wheresoever? And um, that is, um, the problem with this is um, killing a thread is not like killing a process. So if you kill a process, the operating system will clean up. That's not the case in threads. So it's pretty likely that you really bring your program in a pretty corrupted state. And um, you can't really um, deal with that situation. And um, although there's some support somewhere um, where there are enough recommendations to say, no, no, don't support that. Don't do that in general. Um, don't, that's not an option we should go with. So, um, Another, what, um, another option would be we tell, you have to stop. We don't take, accept the no as an answer. And um, yeah, um, this is somehow, both is somehow supported in P threads by cancel with a deferred mode saying, well, I, you have to cancel. I don't matter how long it takes, but um, you have to. Uh, that's at least rude. And uh, that especially works well for languages without exceptions and, and stack unwinding. Um, but again, you run into significant problems. We can ask politely and accept uh, a rejection. That's better in practice. You run in, in some interesting uh, problems. And um, that's, for example, uh, kind of what boost thread interrupt does. And um, the last thing is, flag and let it pull. That's what we call cooperative cancellation of a thread. That is, we just say, hey, according to us, as a caller of this thread, we no longer want you to run. And the thread deals with it however it likes. Um, so, which means you have to do, um, you have to check it from time to time. It's like sending an email, um, you're out of work. 
um, you can you can stop the work. And uh, that could be done in all these different platforms and languages manually. And that is what we accepted as the best approach because we uh, see an easy way to do that. And um, we see the, not a lot of problems with that. Here's a question in the, in the chat. If the threat, P threat called join, if join, joinable, why couldn't we have been introduced to the regular STD thread as an update? Well, first of all, um, we change behavior. And um, the, so for example, um, it might be okay not to join, not to wait and have a call down. In fact, when we discussed that, when we discussed that feature, there was always strong arguments. You saw the strong votes against fixing this, that for example, in embedded systems, there's no problem with the call down. Um, well, just your embedded system process dies. So in this case, your thread dies and you have a watchdog thread and that restarts the thread. So where's the problem? Or that when the whole process dies, let's restart the whole process. So um, it was at least, we, we could have done that, but um, from a from backward compatibility point of view regarding um, um, API and ABI compatibility, that would, with, this would work. But uh, semantically, that would be a change, and not everybody might have liked it. So, okay, coming back here, options to cancel a threat. So we decided um, we want to introduce this this way to do it. So um, a J thread has something to request the stop, and a thread we start has something to check for a stop. For example, um, a call in the current thread whatsoever, um, but a, a lot of questions came up. So um, how to signal, should we, should we be able to signal stop from different places, different threads? What is copy and move semantics? How expensive is it to copy and move around the corresponding objects? Uh, what about lifetime issues? We have uh, asynchronous communication between two threads. Um, how do we clean up? Um, should we have the same objects for requesting a stop and dealing with a stop or checking for a stop? Um, could we use a, a stop twice? Could we signal it twice so that you can say stop and then the thread says no, and then later you can say stop again? Things like that. Okay, the first design was this. The first design we had was this. Let's start the thread and let's introduce a stop token. So part of jthread is not only a thread we start, it's also an object which we can use to signal a stop. And this token is something like an atomic bool. Um, well, maybe better, you can think about it as a shared pointer to an atomic bool because we need it at different locations. And what we do is um, we create this shared pointer to an atomic bool um, here when we start the thread and then the, the starter thread gets access to this atomic bool. And the first idea was to say, um, let's, let's just every thread have this, this token, this a way to, to check, should I continue to run or should I end? So if somebody here could then say, I request a stop, the token is, becomes true. And if here um, the thread checks from time to time, it's a, it's a stop requested, uh, it can react. So could be that we have SCD this thread stop requested here on SCD this thread throw if stop requested. That was part of the first designs we had. Um, the problem with that is if you have TLS data, so if you, if you declare thread local storage in, in thread local storage new data, you, Every single thread pays for that. Every single thread has an additional member. Uh, it might not be initialized, but you at least need this memory. So that affects every started thread. Uh, by the way, even an SCD thread started that way would now have an additional member like that, which to some extent could be even cool, but um, the price was too high for us, um, which turned out 
uh, after several discussions. So that was for months, the first approach. So the next idea was, no, um, we don't use TLS, uh, we use a parameter. So that means um, the function we call takes what we call now a stop token. During the discussion of this whole feature, the names were totally different. So um, I just, for the, throughout this whole talk, use the final names, uh, which we choose so not to uh, confuse you more than necessary. So um, just add a first argument to your callable, whether it's a function or of lambda or whatsoever, and the first argument has to be a certain type, a stop token, and that you can use to check for uh, whether we should stop to run. So if you request a stop, uh, we, for example, could here have a loop in the thread uh, was stop requested and why not we continue with our processing. So from time to time, we have to check. Cooperative um, cancellation or stopping. How, how to do that? So let's, let's implement that. So here's class J thread with that approach. So two members here, the token and the thread. Um, and our constructor, I'm, I leave the destructor out because I wanna show you something. So this is a implementation of the constructor, taking the callable to call and the arguments to pass to the callable. So the first thing is we initialize the token by um, no, stop has not been signaled. Um, please note, it's intentionally and it's important that the stop token is the first member because we need this token to initialize the thread. So we have to do it that way around. And um, then we um, initialize the thread. The thread just gets this data, a but a little bit more. So we don't forward this data directly to the underlying thread. We add something, namely, this token. So the way we do that is uh, inside the constructor, we have a lambda. That lambda gets the callable and the arguments. So jthread gets the callable and the arguments. We pass them to this lambda as an argument. The lambda gets them. And the lambda passes them to invoke with the stop token in between. So we call the callable. Um, and with our arguments, but as a new first argument, the stop token is passed. And the stop token we have just initialized here with false, and we have access here to our member, so we can just directly pass it here. It took a while until somebody came up with an email and saying, there's a bug. You can't do it that way. And now we come to a couple of bugs um, that demo um, how tricky sometimes concurrency is. And I only demo here the, the trivial bugs, trivial and relatively to the others. So do you see the bug? Anybody? So now if we, Was it discussed any thoughts on whether the thread could be immediately started after construction? Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, you start the thread immediately, it should be started immediately. That's all fine. And that's what we program here. Yes, we do that. Anybody seeing the back? Can't do it that way. Don't do that. Oh, why not start it explicitly? Well, I think we have it explicitly or explicitly with some kind of, that's minor details. <laughs> or do you, do, do you mean not, not using invoke? If you mean not using invoke, please note that, that invoke gives you the, the functionality that you might pass um, a callable together with a member. Uh, no, uh, as a callable, you might pass a member function um, and that is some benefit using invoke. Um, this is, yeah, in practice, what the, uh, what the implementation does is anyway, another question. So anybody found the bug? 
So here it is. You start a, a J thread, calling this function with these arguments. And then that means um, we come to the constructor and that means the um, stop token is initialized with false, no stop requested yet. And we initialize a thread with uh, to say, well, please thread, start a thread, calling this. The arguments we pass is the callbacks, so func and the arguments, so arg1 and arg2. Great, everything is nice. And now, immediately, we push back this thread, this J thread into a vector. We move it into a vector. So that means move semantics is used here now. And that means that um, it might happen that the stop token was immediately moved away because the move semantics calls move for the members. So <laughs> you call invoke, but please note, we, we, we start, we initialize the thread, and then the constructor is done. The thread internally takes a little bit to, to call this lambda and, and to start with what the thread should be doing. So um, here inside, we now use the token, but unfortunately, the token was moved away. You can't do it that way. Don't do that. Um, don't pass by reference when you start a thread. Also, and especially not a reference to members. Um, they might be moved away. Um, so um, please, um, we fix that, and that fix was easy. Um, we also have to pass a token here. Our own member, we have to pass to the member to the to the thread uh, as an argument, so that we have a copy already of that. And so it doesn't matter what with what happens with the original J thread. Um, this token is passed to the thread to invoke. Okay. Good. So never pass or capture members by reference to other threads. Okay. So everything is fine, huh? Let's see. Um, we have here a starting thread, atomic pool. We have here uh, a started thread, getting a stop token, and we can check whether stop is requested or not. But, but, we want to be backward compatible, as backward compatible as possible. So it should also work if F here, this F has no stop token in the argument. So um, that means the stop token could be uh, required or could be not. Or the, the real behavior we wanted to have is this. This is an old program that has a problem the problem I showed you. So we have here included a header five thread. We have here a task to start in a thread. Here we start a thread calling this task with some arguments. Here we call join and here we have a problem. Here we don't have the try catch clause. And so on an exception, this might terminate in quarter. So this, the fix for this code should be to switch to C++20 and just add a J, just add a J, nothing else. So everything else should work as before. Please note, this, this is also what we designed. So you, you don't need a new header file, and you don't need new parameters in the, in the task you start. Um, we just added this functionality more or less transparently by adding a J. So um, to do that, um, it was necessary to say, well, the task might take a stop token, then it gets it. It might not, then it will, um, yeah, not get it. And signaling stop has no effect. It's as it has been before, but at least we call join at the end. How did we implement that? Um, we had, we had um, here the declarations of our two members. Here's our constructor. And look at the constructor taking now the stop token and the arguments for the thread to call. And we use a compile time if, which fortunately was standardized in C17. So in C17, we can check 
with also a new type trait, is invocable. Um, is this invocable with a stop token as second argument? If that is the case, we pass a stop token. Otherwise, we don't pass a stop token. And that way, uh, we handle both the optional stop token uh, or not. Okay, that was the basic design. And you saw a couple of issues we had already. Um, there was a moment Louis Baker jumped in and Louis Baker said, um, hey guys, um, interruptible um, software, um, that's, that's something we need somewhere else. And we should, and we should, we should implement it more generic we would have something like a stock token also in other places. And one really missing feature then is that you can, can use signaling stop by calling a call back, something that, uh, that you can, we can trigger with this cancellation or stop request, a function call. And um, so the request was to generalize stop tokens. Well, in fact, to merge it with another implementation we had, uh, coming from the area of coroutines. So the decision was uh, we had a stop source to, to request, signal a stop, then a stop token to actively check and pull, pull for the requested stops. And then we have a stop callback to register callbacks. And uh, that all in one header file that has nothing to do with threads, threading, just stop token. It's, it's standardized under that name. And that could be used for to, synchro, to, for to signal stop in synchronous or asynchronous operations like coroutines, executors, networking, I.O., et cetera. We will, we will use them later in, in other areas of the C++ standard. We are pretty sure about that. So the general API is as follows. You can say, okay, stop token. Um, let's create a stop source. That's the source of all trouble, no, of all signaling stuff. And from that, we get the token. So we decided to have two objects, not one for signaling and checking. We had so two parts of the coin because that makes the APIs a little less error prone um, for the programmers. So they, you have an idea where they come from. So the one who can signal stop, the one who can um, check for stop, and both is copyable and movable. So we can do that from different locations. It's pretty cheap. It's not that cheap. It's a little bit like passing. If you copy it, it's like passing shared pointers around. They need internally atomic, so it's not that cheapest operation. But um, obviously, we would not pass stop tokens a lot of times around. So you would call a function. The function takes the stop token and the process here, uh, the function we call can then request is a stop requested. And if the source then requests the stop, um, this becomes true. And by the way, we decided that this is a one way event. You will see later why, uh, later see why. And, and the new functionality we added was um, instead of checking manually, polling again and again, what's going on? We have, you can register a stop callback. That's now good design, an AII type. So you say for the lifetime of this object, if for this stop token is stop requested, this function is called or this call, callable is called. And at the end of the lifetime of a stop callback, um, it will no longer be called. So we can temporarily register functions or lambdas to be called on a stop request. Good. Let's add it. And um, let's add it to JThread. So, oh no, before we do that, let's look at a few other examples. So, here's uh, one of the test cases we have. So, you register for a stop token, a stop callback, and this is not called yet if you request stop. It was called, so then an internal object is, is true. And please note, the question was also, what do we do if we have requested a stop and then we, in, insta, then we um, insert or register a new stop callback 
And the answer was, once we have requested a stop, it is requested. So the stop callback, when it registers this function for requested stop, for a stop token where stop was requested, it will immediately be called. That way we have no data races. It doesn't matter that we are right on time when we register this call back. Whether this request stop arrives first or the registration happens first, so think about these are two different threads. At the end, we, it is guaranteed that this callback will be called once in a time. And we had a couple of other uh, decisions to make that way. Um, so for example, there were discussions when we register callbacks, how do we deal with R, R values versus L values? Um, so the callbacks could be R values and L values. Um, what happens um, if, for example, um, uh, if we have a registered multiple callbacks and uh, that callback um, unregisters or uh, while we are in the destructor of a callback, another callback is registered, et cetera. So things like that were discussed, a couple of them, and a couple of interesting problems. Um, so we ha what happens if we race deregistering a callback with a request for a stop? And then we have some rules, for example, um, if a callback is deregistered first, the callback is not invoked at all. Otherwise, the destructor blocks. So if we are in a destructor, um, and uh, if, 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 if we have a destructor here for a stop callback, it's not a problem to uh, when somewhere else an un a deregistration happens, um, et cetera. I will not. I will not discuss all of them. That's something we have to document later. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, here's some wording. I don't discuss that, but just to show you, yeah, we have very careful wording here to, uh, to, to show and to decide uh, that what exactly happens there. I have no time to explain everything and I can't explain everything anymore right now unless until I will double check it again for my C++20 book for the upcoming one. So um, one another example, if I register a stop callback and a second stop callback, and then I call a function, it might temporarily register a third callback. At the end of this function, the destructor unregisters it. When we then request stop, we have still two callbacks that are registered and will be called. And if we later on um, register another callback, it will also be called. So things like that uh, is a basic behavior we have. Good, let me see. Are there any new questions? Okay, no. Okay. Ah, I don't understand the Q&A tool, but okay. So, now that's not all. Now we have to talk about condition variables. So um, the corner case and the proof that the whole system works was um, that we uh, that we should be able to interrupt weights. If a thread waits for a condition variable while um, when a, when a stop is request. So just to remind you, what is a condition variable? A condition variable is something where you can uh, signal, um, where you can let the operating system wake up a thread um, so that the thread has not pull again and again for a certain condition. So instead you have a condition and if this condition is true, you wake a waiting up make up a, a waiting thread. So one thread might say, um, I wait, I wait for something to be ready. Another thread might say, I wait for something to be ready, maybe together with a timer. So it's a timed waiter. And then another thread might say, okay, let's, let's wake one of them 
up or wake, let's wake um, all of them up. Um, that's a general idea. And this helps that here, that one of these threads don't have to check again and again. Um, is something going on? Is there something we should do whatsoever? Um, everything would be great if there's not a problem in operating systems. A general problem with condition variables, which is, which is called spurious wake-ups. Spurious wake-ups mean that um, if you're waiting for a notification of from here, you might wake up without having this notification done. So it's like, like if you sleep at night, you say, uh, this is my alarm clock, please ring at nine. And you wait for this alarm clock, but you wake up in the middle of the night. And there are technical reasons to get combined with performance reason why this can happen. And um, so um, the way to deal with that is you deal with that like um, dealing with um, when you wake up in the middle of the night. Um, you look at your clock, alarm clock and say, oh, oh it didn't ring. It's not 9 a.m. or so. Um, so <laughs> I continue to wait. So in fact, wait is a loop uh, where you, whenever you wake up, double check that the condition is true so that it's 9 a.m. or in our case that, I don't know, a vector has now elements or uh, that we have some data provided at some location whatsoever. So that's what you have to program. So the usual way to, to do that is um, by design since C++11 at this. So um, you need a, some condition, could be a Boolean condition, could be a, a vector being not empty, could be your condition. Um, and then you have to double check this condition. So somebody has to modify the condition, the writer, and the reader has to check the condition, is it true or false? And then you need this notification mechanism. And it's, it's like I said, for example, here, your condition is now true. You, you wake up one of them. and But here, the waiter says, um, let me wait uh, in a loop. And what you don't see here, you are programming here a loop. So how, how is it, how, how does it work? So ready, ready is, is the way to signal we are ready. So here, tr ready, true signals we are ready. Here, we have to check whether we are ready. So um, that is, the access to that is protected with the mutex because um, we read and write in two threads at the same time. And for one other reason you will see in a moment. And here's the notification. So this wait, as you see, does get two more attributes. The lock got for this ready mutex and a way to check for the condition, a lambda. And um, so how does it work? The unique lock locks the mutex. So because we need that to check for ready. So, and, and this wait function internally calls this. A loop where we check, um, is this predicate here? Is this lambda, is this true or not? So, and it, if not, so if we are not ready, we enter the body of the loop. So um, check whether it's ready, no, it's not. Nobody has said ready to true yet. So uh, then, okay, that's it. We have to unlock the ready mutex because otherwise we don't grant access for others to set ready to true. And then we block, um, we do the system block, the system, the operating system specific block call. And um, once we wake up, we lock again because we want to double check ready again or this condition. And then we might find, oh, this was a spurious wake up. So, um, oh no, we are still ready is false. So let's uh, unlock again and fall asleep again and so on until we have, um, until we are done here. Okay. Um, please note that due to spurious wake ups, it can also mean if, if, if somebody, some, um, some, thread calls notify one and multiple threads are waiting, all of them are woken up. That's a valid implementation. That's then a spurious wake up of all the others. One of them 
has to be woken up, um, but um, others might also wake up. And But as I said, they are checking the status and uh, check ready. So the first one sees ready is true, might, for example, mean there's a value uh, to be to be able to process and uses the value. So the others, uh, as we block access to ready, the others are still blocked. And then when they check, they see, oh, there's still no value. So for them, it's a spurious wake up. So that's that's the magic of um, condition variables. So sorry for the long interruption, but I have to explain how uh, we can here integrate the, the stop mechanism because it's not tr trivial. So JThread as a thread and a stop token. And we have here, when we started, we have here our stop token, which is because we use callbacks, a list, a list of callbacks we can use. And um, here um, we call the function that gets the stop token. And in this get stop, in this function, we call wait. Now, what wait does? The stop token no, not, knows nothing about condition variables. The wait registers the condition variable here in this list. We have a list here. To some extent, that's a list of callbacks to call. And one of these callbacks is notify the condition variable. So this callback, the callback we register here is wake me up. So wait before it really falls asleep, registers in the stop callback, wake me up if stop is request. If then there's a request stop, um, we call here a notification. So we call here notify one. And that means we wake up and then we double check the condition in our case, the condition now has an, an additional thing to check, which is, was stop requested? So we have to check, was stop requested? That's another condition then from the outside saying uh, something is ready. And then if that's the case, we unregister ourselves again, because we, we no longer need this registration mechanism. And we could double check then, was stop requested and we, we react. So when we leave wait, it could be because ready as signal, it could be it's a spurious wake up and it could be um, stop was requested. And that's here what we can check here. And uh, so there's also an if, if the loop is inside the wait, uh, the if will tell you the, the return type of wait will say there was uh, the, the predicate is true, so we are ready. So there was no stop requested. And um, please note that in all these cases, after this, we are still locked. We can now check access. Here, for example, it's a vector mutex, so we can access the vector and, and use it. Please note, all of this could be done with multiple threads. So why one thread register a wait here, another thread come, can come from somewhere else. So in this um, stop token, we also need a new tag for registration. So we have to protect that why this list of registered callbacks is used, that nobody uh, enters this, well, it's a little bit more complicated. We can do that even while it is true, but we have to make sure that nothing breaks so that, that we have a clear, clear situation, a clear state there. When exactly the registered callback is called on which thread? Well, when we request stop, we go the chain of all reg registered callbacks and call them all. We don't give give uh, any guarantee of the order um, in which in in which that happens, and they are called in the thread where they have registered for. So here in this wait, we wake up this thread which has called this wait. So let us implement that. 
So that's a task. That's a task we want to call. So that's a thread we start. So that is a thing on the right on the previous slide. Um, here we have the wait call. For example, we want to wait that a vector is no longer empty. That's our condition to check. So we have a, there should be an element to process in this vector. So, uh, and the rest is the usual thing. So there's V should be a vector. I should maybe add it to this slide. V MX is a new text protecting access to the vector. And this is a condition when we want to be woken up. If this is not empty, we want to do something. Um, that's the code we want to work. So as, as I said, we have now integrated the stop mechanism. Um, the return value of weight will tell us whether this condition holds, if that holds. So if it's, if it's not empty, then we can process this. If the return value is false, we know stop was requested and we can do whatever this means. For example, just leave this thread. How do we implement that, uh, this weight? How do we implement that? So um, here's a weight taking the lock guard. So to, to use this new text, um, the stop token and the condition. This is a condition. So the first thing is we register ourselves, our own um, condition variable. This condition variable we register to be notified. So you see it here, we, we, we pass the, ourselves to a notify all call, uh, which does the work. And that is, that is done in, as a stop callback. So for the duration of wait, uh, we will be notified if there's a stop requested. At the end of this, uh, we will unregister ourselves um, so that we are no longer being called. We, there might no longer be this condition variable. Then we have this loop. While this, we are not ready, while this condition is not true, so not, not empty. In other words, while the vector is empty, we have this loop. Then we double check, oh, well, stop requested. Um, then that's it, return false. Otherwise, let's unlock uh, our access to the vector, fall asleep. So go to the system, underlying system, condition variable, really call wait there or whatever the call is. And once we wake up, we lock again, we check the vector and we have this loop. Okay. So that's how it works. Here we have um, something, we, we get a value, we push it back into a vector and then we notify all the waiters. Um, here we have threads that wait, that get the token and uh, they register themselves falling asleep, wake me up when I'm no longer ready. Um, so they register themselves to be notified. Um, uh, maybe we also register a stop callback um, that is in general be called, even if we are not in this wait, um, that would also work. And we could also, for whatever reason here in this thread, call a callback when this notification is called, or in a third thread, all of this works. Um, that's, that's a singly linked list. It, it takes arbitrary number of, of uh, callbacks to be called. And now, if somebody calls a request stop, and typically here this thread, uh, but it might be also a third party thread, um, this atomic pool gets true, and we um, enter the, the, the list of uh, registered callbacks. So we might call this callback, we might call this callback, which ends the wait and calls the destructor for the callback. So it will remove itself from this list. And then we call this callback. And then we can here on the right-hand side process the data. Okay. Now here's a slide called reality. We have half an hour left, so it, it seems everything is fine. So we are ready. It works. It works. No, 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 no. Now this problem start.
And I give you one example of a problem we had. Only one of a lot of problems we had. It's a pretty simple example. So we have here a thread. Um, which starts another thread. So the token is created and we have another thread that is started here. So here's a J thread start. So in this started lock, we, uh, we deal with a vector with something. We have a vector with a mutex and a condition variable to notify. So we lock this mutex. We have access and we wait. So we have access, we want to see is a, is a vector not empty. So that's the way you do it. Oh, there might be an if around, but something like this. Now, that means, as you remember, we register our own condition variable here as callback for this stop token. And once again, Remember what this means, the code of this weight here. Yeah, we, we register ourselves at this top token, then we unlock the access to the ready mutex. In this case, to the vector is empty mutex, or in general, what we protect is access to the vector. And we call wait, we fall asleep. Okay, so here we fall asleep and that means we lock here this mutex. Like, no, excuse me, no, we, uh, no, we wait here, forget. So here, we are here, so, okay. My animation is not perfect here. At the same time, this thread says, I wanna have access to the mutex. So this thread locks this mutex and request stop. So what happens is, um, so it might be something like, I, I found yes, a problem with my vector, stop, have all my um, all machines stop. And um, so um, that means we go here to the list, by the way, we lock access to this list um, and call our callbacks. This means the wait is called here and, and this we wake up. A notification is, is raised, is sent. So our, our internal system con uh, condition variable does not block anymore. We wake up and right after we wake up, we want to lock our vector <laughs> to, um, to, yeah, to check the condition. Unfortunately, we can't lock it. <laughs> That's a deadlock. We have here already the vector mutex locked here, here. They have called request stop with a locked mutex of our condition. So we are blocked. We have, we have really a problem. Request stop waits for all calls to be finished. So we wait here and we wait here to get access to the mutex. And please note that it might also happen that one thread does this, and this is done by another thread, a third thread at the same time. So how should we deal with that situation? And it's, it's not that unlikely that this happens. That was an interesting discussion. A lot of emails I, I saw it in my, my email folder when I re-prepared this talk. So at the end, um, we had to decide between six different options here. So we could do polling, check again and check again and again, but that is exactly what we wanted to avoid with condition variables. And we could use a background check to solve the dilemma. Um, we could uh, extend condition variables to also use recursive mutexes, which by the way, normal condition variables don't support. We could use condition variable any, I will talk about that in a moment, we could restrict the use of request stop, could say it's not allowed to call it while a vector is, is locked, but remember that could be a totally different thread. So how do you guarantee that? And we don't provide interruptible um, condition variable weights at all. And that, 
this is an official slide we had when we discussed that in the standardization. So let me explain what a condition variable any is. A condition variable any is um, a condition variable that internally uses its own mutex for to handle the condition the conditions correctly and separated from external mutexes. And that, by the way, for example, means that a condition variable any can use other than a standard mutex um, out, outside. So we introduce an inner mutex to deal with the condition variable. And uh, because the library knows uh, controls how to use this inner mutex, we solve the dilemma, the problem. And I don't have the details how to solve that and why it's solved that. That's pretty tricky. But um, yes, with the condition variable any, we can solve this issue because we have a second mutex to solve this problem you just see, you just saw. So this was uh, the only option we had that would have no show supper. For every, every other option, we said that's not an option at all. Especially the last one. Look, if we, if we don't provide a, a solution for interruptible CV weights with the top to subtoken, programmers will make the same and worse mistakes. So we should solve the whole issue. Here's how it got solved. Condition variable any weight. So it's now a weight implemented only in condition variable any. So if you use um, this interruptible weight mechanism for J threads, and you have condition variable, it's adding J and switching from condition variable to condition variable any. So there is also um, four more letters to type underscore any. And um, so here's the implementation of wait now. So if stop requested, um, please, uh, we return false immediately. Um, there's a stop callback. Um, we register that we are not get notified as condition variable, and we check is the predicate not true. And here you see that we have a user lock from the outside, a lock from the outside is coming, and we have an inner lock that we also have to lock. And then if stop was requested, we break again. And then here we have a temporary unlock. Uh, this is this is a lock guard working the other way around. This is stolen a little bit from the from the GCC implementation. We have not standardized that. You don't find that in the standard, but it's it's working like that the constructor unlocks so that when we have an exception here, it automatically locks again the user lock. And then we wait, but the, the system wait doesn't use the lock from the outside. So that's not that's still there. And um, the user lock is unlocked. So from the outside, we have access to the vector. And uh, the inner lock that we need to lock our communication with the condition variable is locked. And again, we found a bug. That bug was easier to find because we had a deadlock. Um, does somebody see the deadlock here? <laughs> oh, that's, that's even more tricky than the one before. So I, I tell you immediately how it was. So look, look at the situation, how this is called. If somebody calls this way, we have our, our mutex is locked. The user lock is locked. We pass a unique lock, a unique lock usually there. So that is locked. And then we enter, we call this wait function. In this wait function, uh, we do uh, all the registrations and, and pre-checks. And then we check, um, is the condition not true? And that means, yeah, we have to wait. So we lock our inner mutex because we now need uh, the um, condition variable protected and the outer mutex we unlock. So the outer mutex is unlocked and then we call the wait. That's the situation. And then um, when we wake up, for whatever reason, a spurious wake up, um, a, uh, the condition holds or stop was requested, whatsoever, um, we have here the closing curly braces. So we end this block, which means we, we call the destructors of the lock guards in the opposite order. So 
the first thing is here we call the we call the locker again for the user lock. So the destructor of this locks the user lock, and then we call the un the the unlocker for the inner lock. So, and uh, and that's 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 the end of the function. So does somebody see the problem now? We have. Look here, there's something very suspicious. Here, look at the order of these two locks. We have locked the user lock inside, then we lock the inner lock. And at the end of this body, we first lock the inner lock and then lock the user lock. That's not good. <laughs> that's, that's the opposite order of two lots. Don't do that. That's, that's a perfect recipe for a deadlock. So um, yeah, somebody said, said it inside, yeah. So um, all we have to do, uh, we have to change the order of these calls because it doesn't matter in which order we have them, but we, have, we can't do it that way. And I learned something which I didn't know is you can change the order of unlocks by move by creating a new lock guard and moving a lock into it. So look at this. We say here the inner lock that was locked here is moved to a new object. Move means it's 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 no longer controlled by this. It's now controlled by this by this lock guard. But this lock guard was declared later than this. So that means um, we have reserved the order of the destructors. So first, the destructor of the inner lock will um, be called, and then the destructor of the unlocker. And that means we get this order, and that means here, this inner uh, mutex is already unlocked again, and we have no deadlock anymore. Awesome. I, these were the simple examples we had. We had so many examples um, discussing scenarios with four different threads and so on. And you know what? I'm now very, very, very happy that we have standardized this thing. Please note, I have no idea about all these details and the solutions did never come from myself. There were a lot of other experts of the C++ standard committee involved who found the problem, double checked the code and uh, found the solution. But it was only, only for a generic, generic mechanism to signal stop, which can be used in condition variables of a threat and avoid possible races. We can't avoid all problems, but most of them we can. And that's, that's a reason why at the end, I'm so thankful that we have this now because all, all the problems I told you, programmers can do themselves. They can, they, can, they can run into all these traps in, for non-trivial non scenarios and it will be a nightmare for sooner or later. So guys, that's it. I don't have slides for all the other problems. Part of the reason is I can't explain that. Uh, but there are, as I said, more tricky corner cases. So the lesson learned is um, this, this, this problem is solved. STD thread is uh, calling join. No longer needs to try catch block if you insert a J. That's it. Switch to C20 and um, it, there are a few corner cases where, where, you, where you don't want to have a join here for some reason and uh, where you intentionally um, can create a mess, but um, it's very tricky code and very unusual code. Um, so um, I, I would recommend almost to do it almost blindly to add a J here to make things more robust and more safe. But 
you might not do that. So add a J and, and that's it. And if you add it, and after this join, you no longer have to do something. You don't even need the join anymore because at the end we will anyway have here wait for the thread, but no, we will, we will request stop. So um, it's better to have the join there. That means uh, we wait for the end without a request for stop. That's, that's a mature design now. So I don't recommend to skip join because this is still doing something different than the destructor. This is join without signaling stop. This is um, join with signaling stop. So we might interrupt the thread earlier than we thought. So replace SD thread by J thread. Good code works as before. Broken code gets hopefully fixed. Um, and in general, use stop tokens to signal cancellation. Um, this is trivial. This is inbuilt in J thread. And it's easy to use in other contexts. We will add it to condition variables, to um, a notification mechanisms to um, boost uh, ASIO when we have it in the standard, et cetera. And, uh, it might be used there where, when we think it's, it's useful to have it. Yeah, I learned a lot. Uh, the first of all I learned was concurrency is so tricky. And, uh, it's a nightmare and to use it, but it's uh, one of the most important technologies we have to make code fast now um, with the end of Moore's law. Um, C++ is tricky, no way, but uh, most of the problems here um, come from the underlying system. So operating system problems, uh, having something like spurious wake-ups, et cetera. Testing, testing, testing. Um, our test code, and our example implementation is uh, is huge. Um, if you want to want to look at the example implementation, search for JThread on GitHub or JThread and Yosotis and GitHub. There is the repository with um, all the code. Well, not not the original code now in GCC or somewhere else, but um, the code as we could do it as an extension to the existing C plus plus eleven and 14 standard. Standardization is a joint effort. This was to some extent the development of a new feature, which usually we should not do. Usually standardization should standardize existing practice. So one, one usual comment for this was, okay, let's have it now uh, six years at boost and then we offer it in the standard. Um, I, we were after a while pretty confident that we want to have it directly in the standard because so many problems were solved, which otherwise uh, programmers would do. And please note, even if we find some problems in the implementation, we couldn't can usually fix them um, as long as the API is stable. So um, as we thought the API, the new API is robust, uh, we thought, okay, let's leave it that way. And by the way, I looked it up. I only had 1,000 emails about this topic in four years. And um, never design non-RAII types anymore. It was such a big mistake. And it's, an, it's, it's really a pure, poor observation that we didn't fix it earlier. When we could, when we could do it, just fix it breaking co compatibility because it was so early, we could just add it in SD thread. So just changing the destructor, for example. And it's interesting. Um, on the other hand, um, the original idea of S idea of STD thread, I talked to Howard Hinner about that, and um, was to have this stop token. And uh, but it was too complicated, and they were worried too much about it. And um, so maybe the good news is that um, by having J thread, um, ten years later, and uh, it means that we now have a well-designed thread type where we can signaling stop um, easily. And it works in many interesting cases. Uh, we still have, have not support in other cases. We only have for condition variables. We don't have stop token support for mutexes and atomics. Um, so um, that, that's an option for later, but um, 
Condition variables is the most important things because we, we definitely want to avoid polling and it's a most complicated task. So we see that we can add it later, but currently nobody is working on that. Yeah, and we use a couple of C17 features here. So at the time this was designed, we were, uh, we were really happy about a, a few things we got from C17. And yeah, but backward compatibility is an issue, sure. Uh, another interesting issue, while we, while we standardize it, we created a GitHub. The GitHub um, we used for both configuration management, testing, and also for the proposed wording. So the official documentation um, and the, the document that was went to the C++ standard committee proposing these features and the examples was directly a LaTeX file also in the repository a Git repository for this proposal. That turned out to be very useful, um, especially those who, um, who had to um, integrate it into the standard could just copy and paste the LaTeX code because we used the LaTeX macros of the official C++ standard and uh, that helped them a lot. And of course, good name is key. Um, we went back and forth a lot with all the names. Um, became, for example, stop token, stop callback. Um, a lot of other names are possible there. Interrupt token, interrupt, uh, interrupt or cancellation token. Um, but both were already had some meaning. So interrupt um, as more system interrupt, uh, maybe a, a kill or so, a signal. And, uh, and the um, cancellation, terminology is used for other cases in Windows. Um, so um, we, we came up with stop, which is fortunately even shorter. And I think I'm pretty happy about the name. Um, I, it, it seems to work yeah, now pretty good. Um, yeah, but it, after a while, the name stands for itself. So it's only a problem for beginners. And as a meta command, meta, meta, meta command, turned out that to be far more usable than I thought that we drove this whole issue, uh, even though we gave up and non-experts can standardize. Yeah, I know you say you are an expert, but I'm not an expert in that field. So I'm not an expert in concurrency. I only document all the flaws I find. And uh, I really, I, I, I could not provide, propose this feature without the help of all of them who um, helped me to, to, to write it, to implement it. And there were all the, all the, all the key guys we have in the C++ standard committee. Of course, Howard Hinnan, Mr. Modern C++, the founder of Move Semantics, of Threads, of, of Chrono, et cetera. Um, Anthony Williams, Mr. Concurrency, who helped and found a lot of interesting topics, for example, came up with a solution that condition variable any can solve all our problems we had when we found the problem with the uh, normal condition variables and the deadlock and Louis Baker, who are uh, Mr. Coroutines for me, and who um, came up from a different angel. He's currently implementing the library aspects of the Coroutine uh, stuff. And um, he came up and said, we, I need that for Coroutines. Please make sure that we, that we don't invent something we can't use there. So he came up with the callbacks uh, concept and said, no, let's separate cancellation or signaling stop from the J thread uh, issue. And a lot of other key guys, probably a lot of missing, uh, miss, a lot of them are missing there uh, and uh, helped me a lot. So thanks. Thank you very much, guys, for that. That's it. Um, again, um, you can download the slides at my website, and maybe there's also a download area in um, at the uh, ACCU website. And uh, let me also say, beside the, all the books I, I, I wrote o over my life, a new one is coming, covering C20 as my C17 book, which covers all each and every library and language feature. So I'm, I'm already wor working on that. Um, you can find more details at cppscd20.com and can register to be informed when the first draft is available. And um, yeah, I will definitely, of course, <laughs> document stop, stop tokens and JFET there beside with all the other interesting features 
and um, let's see how long it takes if it's done. But it will be pretty soon. There will be an early draft, and this early draft is driven by first experience, not just by theory, because uh, we already found some issues in the standard or some important hints how to use C plus plus twenty. Um, so if you're interested in an early draft, the ebook will be available very early, and then you can get all the updates for free. That was the advertisement block. Um, and that was a talk. I hope uh, you learned a few things. We have five minutes left for some questions. And um, are there any? It's, it's weird that though normally at, at ACCU, I would have a big crowd of comments and shouts. Uh, this time you were also quiet. So interesting. <laughs> any questions I can answer? Or maybe I can't answer them. Uh, what would happen if the call? Uh, here are some. Um, can different threads share a token? Yes, of course. The, the whole token technology, you can hand them out uh, pretty cheap, like passing a shared pointer. That's the, the price. And uh, yeah, they are designed for that. So, set, so you can also get the token from a J thread. So you can start with J thread and have the first token and can ask J thread for the token and hand it out to other threads. No problem. We have that up. Um, what would happen if the callback fails to be registered due to running out of heap memory? We, we have the usual exceptions, and a bad alloc is, of course, one of the things that can always be raised. Um, yeah, the usual technology. Um, what happens to the stop callbacks when jthread detach is called? Um, when detach is called, you still have. The, the, the stop token is still there. It's, the, it's there for the lifetime of the run of the running thread. Um, if you have before you detach, before you uh, we might, might you might even get it after detach. I'm not sure I have to double check. But at, at least definitely before you detach, you can ask for this for the stop source and for the stop token. And uh, on the J thread side to get, to get it and and take signal stop even even after that, so it survives the detach um, in some way or the other. Yeah. Good. And yes, there is rumor that J thread stands for Yosotis thread. Uh, that will be an ongoing joke about the next 20 years. You might have seen that I try to fix calmly the range based for loop. So the next J for loop will come. And um, yeah, um, let's see. But um, the name changed a couple of times, and it was not my fault that it's called joining thread. I can live with that J, J there. And you might wonder why it's not a long name like joining thread, really. We really wanted to make it as easy as possible to add one more character. And yes, it looks like a Java thread. Um, yeah, that's a price. Um, it, was a, it was a decision that we could not have a perfect decision there. The ideal name would be STD thread, of course. But that name was taken. Were there any trade-offs that you thought, thought were mistakes? Yes, we made a mistake of SCD thread for sure. <laughs> and uh, that was a huge mistake. Uh, but um, so far, I don't see um, um, trade-offs in, in the design of JThread and um, stop tokens, I see mistakes, but it's too early to, know, to find all the, all the things. But um, in general, I think we made the right decisions. We made the right decisions. I still, I'm still very convinced about that. Are stop tokens also considered for async in future? Well, we will have something better than async in future. And when we come up with executors, et cetera, and yes, they definitely can be used there. The other question is, do we have a native support somewhere there? Actually, I don't know, honestly. I know at least that in coroutines, uh, there is some design going on. If you look at the Coral library, um, Louis Baker has um, already um, an interrupt or cancellation token there, and uh, that will become the stop token. Um, 
because his design of the Coral Library was a little bit older. And then he came and we, we joined our proposals to have a common proposal for that. Yeah, okay, that's it. Yeah, it was fun um, to have this experience. Um, I hope next year we see each other face to face. Um, take care and um, maybe some of them I see tomorrow in my template day, template class, modern C++ template class training. Good luck, thank you, goodbye. <laughs>